In this series, we're building up a vacuum tube replica of the Motorola MC14500, which is a little one-bit microprocessor. So we're, we're trying to build a vacuum tube computer. That's just sheer lunacy. <laughs> Uh, but in the previous episode, we built up the 4-bit instruction register, and it looks absolutely amazing. It's just a huge collection of tubes that looks like it's doing all sorts of amazing, wonderful things, but in reality, it's just four D-type flip-flops with some buffers on the end. Uh, but it worked really, really well. And today, I kind of want to expand the functionality of that a little bit. I want to add in some skip functionality. And so it's not going to be quite as massive of a project as the actual instruction register itself, but it's going to add some very interesting functionality to it that's going to become very important in the future. So I have a plan for how I want to tackle that. So let's hop over to the bench. We'll take a look at the game plan, maybe test something out, and then hopefully build up a new circuit board. So let's hop over there and get started. Implementing skip functionality at first seems like a pretty daunting task. I mean, there's a lot of different ways to try and tackle this problem, so how do we know which way is the best? Well, since this entire vacuum tube computer build is inspired extremely heavily by the Motorola MC14500, uh, I figured why not just take a look at how the Motorola chip handled it. And a couple episodes back, we worked with some pretty amazing people, Ken Shrift, Curious Mark, and John McMaster, and uh, we actually got one of these chips decapped so we could take a look at the silicon that was underneath. And with the help of Ken Shrift, we started reverse engineering things. We learned a lot of really amazing, interesting things about that chip in general, so definitely go check that episode out. But for the skip functionality, we discovered that there's essentially three aspects to it that we need to implement in the tube version. The first is that we need a skip register. And the reason that we need a register to do this is because there are two ways to initiate skip on the Motorola MC14500. You can have an instruction that just straight up skips the next instruction, or you can have a conditional skip, which skips the next instruction only if the result register is zero. So we need some conditional logic to kick off this skip register. And then if the skip register is storing our skip bit, we can initiate the skip. And we initiate that skip through the second important part that we need. And through talking with Kim, we found out that the skip is actually initiated through this little collection of transistors right up here by the instruction pins. And it's a pretty simple design. As a matter of fact, we went through and actually reverse engineered the transistors right on that to see how they function. Uh, but essentially what happens is whenever the skip instruction comes in, it pulls all four of the instruction pins high so that the instruction is just one, 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 one. And so our skip, as far as the logic unit is concerned, is just a no operation function. But this leads us into the third thing that we need to implement with our skip. And that is that when the 1111 instruction goes off, that actually also sets off flag F, which is right here. Now we may wanna be using this flag F for other functions external to the processor. And so it would be nice if every time we entered a skip, we didn't kick off flag F, because that means that we may be controlling something when we're not intending to. So the third and final piece of this puzzle is we need to suppress flag F whenever we're doing a skip function. Now to implement all three of these, I would need much, much more of the processor built. So today we're only going to work on one of them. And that is we're going to work on the part that takes all four of our instruction pins and pulls them up to one whenever a skip is active. So let's take a look at what we have right now which is essentially this. We just have 4D flip-flops with the clocks tied together that are controlled by a single clock signal. And then the output and inverted output of each D flip-flop is buffered. And this was what we built in the previous episode. And then these four lines coming off the left here are the instruction coming in. And so whenever we initiate a skip, we wanna make sure that all four of these lines are high whenever we store the data in the D flip-flop. And so looking at the way the Motorola chip did it, it's actually a little complicated for what we need to do. And that's because the Motorola chip was built using CMOS logic and the way it was done was simpler in silicon. But since we're dealing with tubes, I think there's an easier way for us to achieve this. 
And you can see it's really simple. All we're doing is using an OR gate to OR the instruction coming in with the skip signal. And the skip signal is all tied together. So this skip signal is going to come from the skip register that we're going to build much later on when we get down to that area. So if we imagine that we have 0101 coming into here, well, that'll pass right on through to our D flip-flops here and be stored. But if we turn the skip signal on, it doesn't really matter what's here because the skip signal is essentially putting a one onto all four of these lines. And that's the beauty of using an OR gate here. Now we can build OR gates really simply by essentially just using two diodes. That's a really fantastic and simple way to do this, except that the signal that's coming into here is going to be output from another D flip-flop further down in the system. And that's not going to be a buffered output. And so if we were to just use pure diodes here, the D flip-flop inputs here would have such a heavy draw on that signal that it wouldn't actually function correctly. So we need to have a buffer in between our OR gates and our D flip-flops here. And so we can build a buffer pretty easily by just building a cathode follower like this. So on the left here, you can see that we have our data in and our skip signal in, and they both go through diodes and then get tied together. And that is actually just our OR gate. And then the output of that OR gate goes into the grid of our vacuum tube over here. And then you can see that the grid uh, plate is tied essentially to 24 volts through a really small resistor. I'm using 100 ohms, but you could actually just eliminate this resistor altogether and just have that tied straight to 24 volts. And our screen grid is tied to 24 volts through a 100 ohm resistor as well. And then we pull our output off of the cathode. And then the, the other side of that output and cathode goes to ground through a relatively large resistor, 220,000 ohms here. And so when the tube is set up like this, the potential of the cathode essentially floats up to whatever the potential of the grid is. And so if we have 24 volts coming into the grid, the potential of the cathode is going to float up to near 24 volts. I mean, the internal resistance of the tube is going to act like a voltage divider between this 220,000 ohm resistor down here and that internal resistance of the tube. But in a previous episode, we kind of figured out that the internal resistance of the 6AU6 is about 2,500 ohms. So 2,500 ohms and 220,000 ohms, that's a pretty one-sided voltage divider. So we should get near 24 volts out the other side here. Uh, but this is really simple to build up. So let's build up one of these on the breadboard and take some measurements and see what the voltage levels are. And then if we're pretty happy with it, I think we'll hop out to the garage and fire up the mill and maybe cut out a circuit board. All right, so I've got my vacuum tube voltmeter set up here and I've got my circuit built out down here. And this is essentially identical to the schematic that we were just looking at. The only thing that I've added is that there's two little buttons here for our input and those buttons are tied 24 volt through a 33,000 ohm resistor to kind of simulate the high impedance output that we're expecting out of the skip register itself. All right, well, I think our vacuum tube voltmeter is pretty well warmed up. Let me just give it a slight adjustment here. Let's, all right, now let's take a look at our B plus voltage here just to get a kind of a baseline of what we're sitting at. Uh, yeah, and that's showing pretty much right on the money at 24 volts. So now if we check the output off of the cathode of our tube here, uh, yeah, we can see that it's sitting at just about one and a half volts. So it, it never actually gets all the way down to zero. But, you know, one and a half volts, that's a perfect logic low. So that's not a problem for us. So let's push one of the buttons and see what it jumps up to. All right, look at that. It didn't quite go as high as our B plus voltage. We only got up to about uh, 22 and a half, maybe 23 volts. All right, and so there's a little bit of a voltage drop across the diodes. And because the grid is essentially on the other side of those diodes, the output will only ever be as high as the input minus the voltage drop of the diodes. Now also the uh, vacuum tube has about two and a half thousand ohms and our uh, cathode resistor is about 220,000 ohms. So that's going to create a bit of a voltage divider. So that's why we're not getting a uh, output voltage that's at 24 volts. We're a little bit lower than that, but 22 and a half to 23 volts uh, to essentially one and a half volts, that's an excellent logic high and logic low difference. So I think that will actually work really well. 
So I'm quite happy with this. The next step is just to figure out how to fit four of these onto some circuit boards and then have those essentially be our input. And uh, I've been slowly chipping away at designing the entire microprocessor itself in DesignSpark PCB here. But this is designed for the buffered OR gates that I came up with. So let's hop out to the garage, fire up the mill and cut these out. All right, and here it is. And it's actually a really simple board. There's not really a whole lot going on. So what we have on the far left here is our power bus. And these traces on the PCB are twice as wide as all of the other traces. And that's because we're going to be moving quite a lot of juice through this system. And so I wanted to have big power rails essentially on both edges of the machine. And then I have a bunch of pin headers here on the bottom. And these are gonna be the connections to the rest of the machine as we get it built. And the way I'm imagining the layout of the machine is that it'll essentially be split into thirds. And so the upper third is going to be the instruction register and all of the stuff that goes with it. And speaking of that instruction register, just having this sitting here doesn't, doesn't really help us much. So uh, let's hook this up to the instruction register. And in order to do so, I also had to cut out this little connection PCB right here. So let's go ahead and hook this up. There we go. That looks pretty cool. Now next, let's go ahead and slide the instruction register into place and get it hooked up as well. All right, that looks awesome. I know that we didn't add a whole lot to the instruction register, but just having this final piece on the edge here gives this half of it some kind of finality to it. It looks really, really cool. All right, so let's give this thing a test. And in order to test it, we've got uh, quite a lot of connections to hook up. And so I've got a little breadboard here that will help with our whole testing process. So let's go ahead and hook up all the jumpers and we're going to start with uh, negative 12 volts, 24 volts and ground. And then I'm going to borrow 24 volts off of the PCB here to put into our breadboard here. All right, next we'll hook up the skip switch and then data zero, data one, data two, finally data three. So that's gonna be our four bits for the data. And then of course we need a clock so that we can actually clock the data into the D flip-flops. 
So there we go. That should be everything. All right, let's uh, kick the power on and see what happens. All right, so I think everything is uh, warming up and running. I can see we have uh, one VFD illuminated here, and that's because we expected the instruction register to kind of initiate into a chaotic state. So right now all the switches are set to zero, and our skip is set to zero. So if I hit the clock, that should reset everything to zero. So let's give that a shot. Yeah, that's awesome. So the instruction register reset to zero. So that, that actually seems to be working decently well. So next, let's uh, store something. Make sure that we're still working correctly that way. So one, zero, one, zero. Yeah, yeah, look at that. So we have one, zero, one, zero. All right, so let's do zero, one, zero, one. Yeah, there we go, zero, one, zero, one, awesome. Okay, so the instruction register is still working correctly, but here comes the moment of truth. Um, so we'll put in uh, just, you know, zero, 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 one, and then we'll turn the skip switch on. Now, when I hit this clock, if the skip unit isn't functioning correctly, we should see 0001 stored on here. But if the skip unit is functioning correctly, we should see all four VFDs turn on for an instruction of 1111. So let's give that a shot. Yes, look at that. <laughs> awesome, all four VFDs kicked on. So our skip instruction is working. Now, if I turn skip off and I hit the clock again, yeah, there we go, 0001. All right, so we have the beginnings of our skip functionality. We've got that ability to pull our instruction to all one. Now, of course, once we get later into the build, we're going to need to build the skip register as well as some kind of logic to prevent flag F from kicking off whenever our skip register is causing the instruction register to skip an instruction. Uh, but that's quite a ways down the line. So for now, I'm really happy with the way that this thing is working. It gave us an excellent way to not only hook up to what we have now and test it, but also control whether we're skipping an instruction or not. Um, so we're going to keep building on this instruction register that we have here and building it out. Uh, but we're starting to run into a few problems that we're going to need to tackle in the future. Um, the first is, is that we're pulling quiet a lot of juice. As a matter of fact, these jumpers here are getting a little warm and they're getting a little soft. So we need to come up with a better power delivery option, especially as we build in more tubes. But the bigger problem is the inrush current. When we first turn on the power, all of the filaments are cold, so they have a very low resistance. They have to warm up to get to a high enough resistance so that we aren't pulling massive current. But during that small amount of time while the filaments are cold, we are pulling phenomenal amounts of current. So we need to come up with something that will keep that inrush current in check until the filaments get warm enough to switch over to the primary supply. Uh, but that's going to be a mental exercise that we'll tackle in the future. For now, I am really happy with how this is working. The entire thing seems to be expanding really well. And so I, I couldn't be happier with how things are going. And hopefully we can keep up this pace and have a working, functioning vacuum tube computer someday. Uh, but in the meantime, I'm going to keep playing with this. And thank you guys so much for watching. Uh, and we'll see you all in the next episode.